Unfortunately for these cameras, I have a face made for radio, so I apologize. <laughs> when Jennifer and I first married, we had a very evangelistic preacher that, that did our, our wedding. Uh, he, was, he was very good at personal work. And from the pulpit often, he would say, you need to go get them. You need to go, go, go get those Bible studies going. And, and, and uh, you need to, we need to evangelize. The church needs to grow. And he gave a lot of great reasons why. And he referred to, you know, Ezekiel 18. And, and uh, he referred to many passages, uh, like the Great Commission, that, that said all Christians need to go. So, after hearing that week after week after week, I said, okay, I'm, I'm, I'm going to do this. And uh, we printed out a bunch of flyers, and, and I handed them out at work, and I, I said a really special prayer over those flyers. Lord, I hope no one reads those flyers and comes to my house. I was scared to death. And we had a, we had a response. One fellow that I worked with said, yeah, my wife and I would like to come. They didn't have children either. They're a young married couple. And... My parents, who were not Christians, said, yes, we would like to come. Now, we had, a, we had an apartment about the size of this platform. Some of you remember those days, right? And it was Friday night, and they were going to be over. And so uh, they let me know on Friday. I think it was Friday, like midday or, or early afternoon. They said, yes, we would like to come. Uh, and to that invitation, to that Bible. I, I hoped by then that no one was coming, but here they are. They're here to come. I couldn't call the preacher fast enough. And I called him and I said, Hey, what are you doing tonight? Oh, I think I'm going to take my wife up. Before he could finish that, I said, Oh, no, you're not. You're coming over. They're coming. You told me to go get them. And he came. He came and they went out later and, and he took the study from there. I learned a valuable lesson. I sat in on that study. And I sat in on a whole bunch of studies that he conducted, and I learned an awful lot. And since that time to now, as far as the work of the church goes, it's my absolute favorite thing. I, I, would, I would rather that a congregation called and, and, and said, we want you to come, and every night at 7 o'clock, we want you to conduct Bible study. I, I, think, I think that would just be wonderful. I love preaching the gospel, don't get me wrong. And, and I've already expressed uh, my gratitude, and I could spend an hour and a half or two hours just expressing my gratitude to be here. But I am convinced that the work of the church is done in large part by every single member behind closed doors and across the kitchen table. I'm, I'm, just, and I'm convinced that the work of the preacher, his best work is done across the desk or across the table or on a couch studying the Bible with people who need it. I want to talk to you tonight about that. I, I, want to, I want to show you what I do in a Bible study, what I've seen done, and, I, and I, I've, I've adopted uh, many of these things. It's a really simple lesson, and I want to encourage every single one of us to endeavor to hold Bible studies. It's good that you call Chris and say, or, or one of the elders, and you know, say, Arlen, I, I, I need your help. I, I need a Bible study. But it's good that you learn how to do it because they won't always be available. It's good that you call Chris. And, Chris, I, I'd like you to go with me. Go with them. Get involved in these studies. But then do it yourself. I want to give you a study if you have a one-shot study with somebody. I, I know people who have done this. They've gone on hunting trips, and, and they've met up with people, and, and they've had nothing but dirt and their finger, and, and they've, they've drawn things in the dirt and, and, and uh, illustrated things and, and talked with people. They've, they've pulled out napkins in restaurants and, and with a pen or a pencil and, and gone through these things. We can do this. We can do this. This is how I go through the Bible study. I, I learned this illustration uh, early on. This is when Jennifer and I were, were first uh, married. Take out an object. Take out a pencil. Or, or just say, look around this room and say, what do you think the square footage of this room is? And just ask. Them. Now, and they'll look around. Or, or how long do you think this pencil is? They'll give an answer. If someone else is with you, they'll give an answer. And, and another person will give an answer. The answer doesn't really matter. I don't know how big this auditorium is. It, it may be uh, uh, 
900 square feet. I'm not sure. A builder might laugh at me right now and say, well, you're way off the base. I can look at this thing. That's fine. You know, he, he may have the right square footage. It doesn't matter what the square footage is. Here's the illustration. How do you find out the measurement of that room or of that object, that pen you're holding up? You take out a ruler, right? You take out a ruler and you measure it. You know what the, what the scriptures are? The scriptures are the standard of measurement. These are called the canon, C-A-N-O-N, of scriptures. The word canon, it means standard or ruler or measurement. That's exactly what it means. And so you, you've already illustrated then that, that this is our authority. And if you can establish Bible authority, that's the first thing you do. If you can establish Bible authority, then you can go on. Now, we're talking about a one-shot study here, so you're not going to be able to spend a whole lot of time with that. If you have to establish authority, you're going to need a whole bunch of, uh, a, a, a whole bunch of series of, of lessons, a, a number of nights, a number of weeks to go through uh, all of this. But in your community, in your area down here, most people believe in God. I, I, I would say it's pretty rare that you're going to find an atheist or an agnostic around here. It's, you come up by, if you want to meet some, come up, you know, come up to Chicago and we'll, I'll introduce you to a whole bunch of but you're probably not going to find that type of person down here. They, they already believe that, that God is the creator of all. Okay, and So establishing Bible authority is, is simply that easy. And, and once you've done that, you know that you can go to the scriptures and, and you, you tell them, say, this is our final word of authority in, in, in all things religious. This, this is it. Okay? Everything that, that we need to know is found right here. Second Peter 1 Peter 1.3 says, According as his divine power hath given unto us all things that pertain unto life and godliness, through the knowledge of him that hath called us to glory and virtue. So, according to his divine power, we have everything that we need right here. Now, I, I, I like to go to this passage. And uh, there was another preacher that illustrated this to me. Uh, his name is Barry Dreyer. Some of you may know of, of him. And, and he illustrated this to me, and it's helped me a lot in, in, in uh, this endeavor. I go to 2 Timothy chapter 3 and, and verse 16. I like to go there, and I like to have them read that scripture, the person that I'm studying with. And, and I like to go over this scripture with them real quick. 2 Timothy chapter 3 and verse 16. It's a familiar scripture to all of us. And I have them open it up. And it reads, all scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be perfect, thoroughly furnished unto all good works. 2 Timothy 3, 16 and 17. You know what, what 2 Timothy 3, 16 tells me? When it says that, that the word of God is, is inspired of God, it comes from God, it's literally God breathed, it is profitable for four things. First of all, it's profitable for doctrine, or you may have teaching in the translation that you use, for doctrine. That is, the Bible tells us what is right. It's profitable for reproof. That is, it tells us what is wrong. So the Bible tells us what's right, and the Bible tells us what's wrong. Then, it's profitable for correction. The Bible tells us how to get right. And it's profitable, finally, for instruction in righteousness. The Bible tells us how to stay right. Okay? So it tells us what's right, tells us what's wrong, tells us how to get right, and it tells us how to stay right. So now you've established Bible authority. And, and, and we can go on with our study here. Always, always ask the person if they're saved. That's one of the first things we learned in school. They, they drilled it into us. And, and it, it's been a great tool ever since. Because oftentimes, if, if you don't do that, you can get to the end of the study and they'll say, well, I believe all that and I've done all that. When really you know that they have. And so ask them ahead of time. Before you even get into anything that they need to do to be saved, say, are you saved from your sins? Are you saved? And if so, why? What have, what have you done? Okay? Or, or what, don't, don't even say what have you done. Say, why do you believe you're saved from your sin? And then don't say anything. Just say, that's great. That's great. Now we're going to, and write it down. I'm going to write this down and, and, and repeat it back to him. Say, okay, you said that, that you believe you're saved from your sin, that, that you're going to go to heaven because of this reason. And then you're going to just take that piece of paper, you're going to put it in the Bible or, or, or your pocket, and you're going to, you're going to bring it back at a later time. 
They say, we're going to table that. Let's go through some things in the Bible together. And let's see if what I have done and what you have done to be saved measure up with what the standard says. Let's just do that. Let's go from there. And then it just depends on who you're talking to and, and, and how much background they have of the Bible. You might need to briefly uh, describe to them the, the story of the Bible, but oftentimes you're going to have people that are already familiar uh, with scriptures and they might be members of, of one of the local denominations. And so you can just go ahead and get started. And, and what I like to do is I like to, to, to take them and to, and, uh, and to say, all right, I want you to be thinking of salvation as a place. All right? This is very important. That, that salvation is, is a place. And, and that we need to be in that safe place. Now, I don't know how the, the fire departments are down here, but the fire departments that we have uh, up uh, in our area and, and in the city of Chicago and, and in the suburbs, we're, we're in Indiana, but we're, we're a suburb of Chicago. Every one of those fire departments is a child safe haven. Is that how it is down here? Is that, is that how that goes usually? But up by us, it's a child safe haven, okay? And I, I give that illustration. I say, and, and children can go there and they know that they're safe. And, and so we need to see if we're safe from our sins, we need to be in that place. And I like to go then to, to uh, Acts chapter 4 and to verse 12. And, and, and I like to, to start the study there, uh, or I mean continue with the study there. And I go to Acts chapter 4 and verse 12. And again, I like them to read them. And then I, we repeat these verses uh, over and over again. But Acts 4, 12, and, and I'll, I'll give the background of the opening verses in uh, in, in chapter 4 of Acts, and I'll say now, you know, Jesus Christ is, is the one that's being spoken of here because his name isn't mentioned in Acts 4 12. But as we read it, then you'll know who they're talking about. And in four, Acts 4 12, it says, Neither is there salvation in any other, for there is no other name or, or none other name under heaven given among men whereby we must be saved. So, so we can't be saved following any man, following any person. We can only be saved when we follow Jesus Christ, okay? And salvation, notice, is in Him. That's, that, that's what that preposition is. It's in Him. It's very important that we are in Him. And then I'd like to jump over, and I'm sorry for all the jumping around. I always apologize for that to them. If, if you think that they don't have a good handle on their Bibles, or or if they, if they uh, are not... Uh, if they don't own a Bible, which that's pretty rare, but if they don't own a Bible, then take two of the same kinds of Bibles. You, you probably have Bibles in the in the uh, backs of the pews here. Go ahead and grab a couple. I, I, I doubt that the elders would mind if you're participating in evangelism. Brother Sam, you think anybody, you think you would mind? If, if, and, and I'm, Arlen, probably you wouldn't disagree, right? You, you would agree, right? And so uh, we're going to go ahead and, and let them take a couple Bibles. And, and you can tell them then the page number. Okay, the page number if they're not real familiar uh, with the scriptures. But I, I like to go then from, uh, from from that passage. I like to go to the book of, of uh, Ephesians. I like to go to Ephesians chapter one. And in Ephesians chapter one, we're going to read a, uh, a couple of verses. And again, I'm stressing to them that salvation is 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 in Jesus. It's in us. And I want you to think of being in Jesus as a certain place. And I like to give them that, that location and keep it really simple for them like that. In Ephesians 1.3, it says, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who hath blessed us with all spiritual blessings. Now notice, and I, I have them underscore this, in heavenly places in Christ. And we go back through it then. And I ask the question, okay, what do we have in Christ? Well, and they would have to back up and they would have to say, well, we have all spiritual blessings. Okay? Well, you know, I, I may not be familiar with what all spiritual blessings are. And I, I'll even just ask them. I'll, I'll say, do you have any idea what some spiritual blessings are? And they may or may not. They may say some things. But it's okay because if you jump down to verse 7, we get a couple of them here. And I say, let's go. Let's jump down to verse 7. It says, in whom... And again, the discussion here is, is being in Christ, okay? In whom we have redemption through his blood. Number two, the forgiveness of sins according to the riches of his grace, okay? So in Christ, we have all spiritual blessings. Two of those are mentioned here. Redemption through his blood. 
and forgiveness of sin. Now, if we've established the fact that the Bible is our authority, and we've established the fact that we need to be saved from our sins, if they agree to that, if they don't agree to that, then you can go back and show them from Romans 3.23 that all have sinned and come short of the glory of God, and then in Romans 6.23 that the wages of sin is death, okay? And so uh, the word death you want to describe to them means separation. The literal word for death means separation, okay? Separation from God, all right? And so uh, our sins then separate us from God. And so here we have then redemption through his blood and the forgiveness of sin, Ephesians 1, 7. Explain that, though. Explain what redemption means. Because if you ask them, they, they may not know. And so the word redeem literally means, if you look it up, it means to buy back. Okay? And so if you have a coupon, and, and my wife loves to shop with coupons and save us a lot of money. And so we have we, she takes all these coupons and she takes them up to the register. What they do then is they buy back, right, a portion of that. Okay? And so that's what it means, that, that Jesus has bought us back. And, of course, you can go then to Acts chapter 20 and verse uh, 28, and you can see that he has purchased the church with his own blood. That's redemption. He bought us back. And so there you have those verses put together, okay? And then we have, of course, the forgiveness of sins. And we understand uh, that we need forgiveness of sins, all right? So there's, the, there's a way to get started, okay? And so... What I like to do then is, and I like to draw uh, pictures for them. I, I don't draw very nice pictures, but I like to give an illustration. And so I draw a circle, okay? I'll draw a circle up at like the top right-hand corner or the top left-hand corner of the page. And in that circle then, I will put, um, or maybe right outside of it, I'll put, you know, uh, all spiritual blessings. And I'll put... Uh, redemption through his blood. I'll put forgiveness of sin. I'll put salvation. Okay? And we can we can list the verses that we've already read. Acts 4.12, Ephesians 1, 3, Ephesians 1, 7, and things like that. There's a whole bunch more, but if they get it, there's no need to go into all the other verses that say the exact same thing because you need to move on. And you have one shot stuff. Okay? You have one time with these people. And so you, you take that and then you say, look, now there are steps leading to this place that gets us into Christ. And we need to go over those steps, okay? And, and you can draw stairs.